The Last Colony, the third installment in the Old Man's War series, returns to the point of view of John Perry, the first book's intrepid protagonist. This novel rekindles the intimate connection with Perry that I loved in the first book, and it presents a narrative that is as engaging as it is thought-provoking. While The Last Colony may not surpass the heights of the first book, it undeniably enriches the series with its heady mix of political intrigue, colonial challenges, and the nuances of diplomacy in a universe teeming with hostility. Given that The Last Colony is the third book in the series, it is inevitable that this review is going to include spoilers from Old Man's War and The Ghost Brigade, so consider yourself warned if you are not yet acquainted with the first two books. The Last Colony begins by reintroducing us to John Perry and his now wife, Jane Sagan, former soldiers who have retired and are living on the colony of Huckleberry with their adopted daughter, Zoe. Now, Zoe is unique because her deceased biological father, Charles Bhutan, the pivotal antagonist from the Ghost Brigades, is revered by an entire alien race as a deity for having created a technology that bestows upon them sentience. As Bhutan's next of kin, Zoe is held in almost equal regard, and this affords her two personal alien bodyguards whom she has affectionately named Hickory and Dickory. The inciting incident, as it were, happens when John and Jane are approached by one General Rye Bickey of the Colonial Defense Forces, and they are asked to establish and lead a brand new human colony, which will be called Roanoke. Hmm, Roanoke. That name sounds familiar, I hear you say. Why, yes, <laughs> indeed it does. The real-life Roanoke Colony, often referred to as the Lost Colony, was an English settlement established in 1585 on Roanoke Island in present-day North Carolina. Mysteriously, by the time supply ships returned to the colony in 1590, every settler had vanished without a trace, leaving behind only the word Croatoan carved into a tree trunk. Just keep all this in mind. Anyway, John and Jane are initially hesitant, but eventually agree, understanding the importance of the mission for humanity's expansion in the universe. The settlers then embark on a journey to their new home planet, but just upon arrival, they face the first of many considerable challenges. The planet at which they have arrived is not, in fact, Roanoke, the planet they had been studying and preparing for but a different, completely uncharted world. This interplanetary bait-and-switch was surreptitiously made by the CDF in order to conceal and protect the upstart colony from a collective of hostile alien entities known as the Conclave, whose primary mission is to put an end to unfettered colonization throughout the universe. Well and truly isolated for the foreseeable and indeterminate future, the settlers begin the hard work of building their new home, and they name their settlement Croatoan, in acknowledgement that they are not where they were meant to be. In the coming months, they face the various challenges of colonial life, including encounters with unfamiliar flora and fauna, unfamiliar terrain and weather, and contentious clashes with the planet's natives who may or may not prove to be intelligent beings themselves. The situation further escalates when, despite the CDF's best efforts, the colony is eventually discovered, thrusting John and Jane into a maelstrom of political and military turmoil, requiring them to steer through treacherous and uncertain circumstances to safeguard the colony's future. The story's climax is a dramatic mix of surprise and strategy, and that is set against 
the backdrop of an impending showdown with sort of a sub faction of the conclave. And this exciting set piece really serves to illustrate Scalzi's ability to build tension and then pay it off in a big way that feels both earned and unpredictable. The book's resolution serves as a brilliant and beautiful send off for the Perry family, whom we have come to know intimately and hold dear over the course of the series. It's a conclusion that celebrates the depth and growth of these characters, encapsulating the trials and triumphs that they have all faced together in a way that really resonated with me. At its core, The Last Colony is a story about the convoluted machinations of politics and diplomacy and the relentless drive for survival in an unforgiving cosmos. The book deals with the moral complexities surrounding the colonization of new worlds and the potential for conflict with other civilizations, encouraging readers to reflect on the justifications for and consequences of expanding humanity's reach across the stars. Through the experiences of the Perry family and the inhabitants of Roanoke, Scalzi examines the sacrifices and compromises made in the name of survival and the toll these decisions can take on individuals and societies. The book also digs into the labyrinthine maneuvering of politics and diplomacy on an intergalactic scale, revealing the unpleasant sinuousness of fragile alliances and betrayals and negotiations that shape not only human interactions, but also extend to dealings with alien species. Like the first two books, the relentless drive for survival is a prevalent theme, though this one gets a bit more granular with showcasing humanity's adaptability and tenacity. The settlers of Roanoke, under the leadership of John and Jane, epitomize the enduring human spirit to face insurmountable odds with courage and ingenuity and a hope for the future. The dynamic between John and Jane and Zoe creates such a heartwarming foundation for the story, making their family unit one of, if not the most endearing aspects of the entire series. Hickory and Dickory also stand out as fantastic additions to this cast of characters, lovable in their uniquely alien traits. The book isn't without its minor flaws, though. A subplot involving Roanoke's hostile natives starts with promise, but ultimately feels underdeveloped and sort of fizzles out, leaving a sense of unfulfilled potential that slightly mars an otherwise very well-crafted narrative. Additionally, and this is something that I noticed in Fuzzy Nation, the very first book of his that I read, and it has been growing with every subsequent book of his that I read as an authorial tick that sort of gets on my nerves, but... Scalzi compulsively and almost exclusively tags dialogue with said. Even questions and passages where character voice is completely clear and there is no mistaking who is speaking. This becomes exceedingly noticeable when I'm reading these books out loud to my wife. And a bit more variety could have really enhanced the flow and emotional impact of conversations. I know that writing gurus say that you shouldn't get too cute with your dialogue tags, but come on, man, you got to get a little creative from time to time. Now, I have seen some criticisms point out that the introduction of a particular technology in the climax feels akin to a deus ex machina, but this didn't really detract from my enjoyment of the story by any means, because I think Scalzi effectively laid the appropriate groundwork to earn it, though I'm sure it will grate against some readers' sensibilities. 
All in all, The Last Colony is an engaging addition to the Old Man's War series that significantly deepens the universe with its thoughtful depiction of life on a new world. Even with its minor imperfections, the book tells a stirring and emotionally rich story that serves as a fitting farewell to the beloved Perry family. But that's not actually the end of the Perry family story, is it? Zoe's Tale the fourth book in the series goes back to the inciting incident of The Last Colony and retells the story from Zoe's POV. Throughout this novel, Zoe matures from a somewhat typical, albeit sharp-witted teenager, into a significant diplomatic figure, filling in many of the blanks The Last Colony left wide open. While Zoe faces some of the typical trials of adolescence, including forming deep friendships and experiencing her first love, she also faces the complexities of interstellar politics and the challenges of forging her own identity while standing in the shadows of her parents, both her biological father and her adoptive mom and dad, John and Jane. One of the key moments in the novel involves Zoe negotiating with a small group of Roanoke's hostile native aliens. Through her ingenuity, her bravery, and her almost preternatural ability to recognize the good in others. She manages to not only save her imperiled friends, but also establish fledgling diplomatic relations with the natives. It's an incredibly effective scene that speaks volumes to Zoe's character and lays a foundation for some of the even more demanding diplomacy that would come later in the novel. The climax of Zoe's tale is indeed a powerful and emotionally charged moment that epitomizes Zoe's journey of self-discovery and her evolution into a formidable individual in her own right, distinct from the legacies of her parents and her biological father. In the first book, we are introduced to the Kansu, an absurdly advanced and unknowable alien race, infamous for their meddling in other species' development, as well as their zealous adherence to a convoluted set of religious beliefs. The Kansu's actions and motivations are often altogether inscrutable, making them <laughs> a wild card in the galaxy's political and military dynamics. The lead up to the climax involves Zoe being sent with her Oban protectors on a diplomatic mission to obtain strategic assistance for Roanoke, and this culminates in a showdown between the Khonsu and the Oban, wherein Zoe is asked to make an incredible sacrifice in the name of expedience. Zoe's stance in this climactic moment, differentiating between what she is, a symbol, a political pawn, a person of interest, almost entirely due to her biological father's legacy, and who she is. A young woman with her own beliefs, her own values, her own desires, is a poignant theme throughout this story. It is in this climax that Zoe firmly asserts her agency, making choices based on her understanding of right and wrong, rather than being swayed by the immense pressures placed upon her due to her unique status. Her ability to stand firm in her convictions, to leverage her unique position for the greater good while also asserting her individuality is what makes this climax so affecting. And it left both my wife and me weeping with pride as Zoe truly and ultimately comes into her own. Central to the book is Zoe's own coming of age story. 
She is grappling with her identity amidst extraordinary circumstances, and the novel explores her journey from adolescence to adulthood, basically, marked by her struggles with the legacy of her biological father, the expectations placed upon her, and her desire to carve out her own path. While this theme inherently gives the book a sort of YA flavor, I think it's a universal aspect of the human experience, making Zoe's extraordinary story relatable to readers through the process of growing up and finding one's place in the world. Zoe is both blessed and burdened by the legacy of her father, which brings with it immense responsibility. The theme of legacy in the novel prompts questions about how one navigates the expectations and responsibilities inherited from previous generations, and how one can honor a legacy while also making independent choices. Like The Last Colony, Zoe's tale delves into the complexities of diplomacy and politics on an interstellar scale highlighting the challenges of negotiation, alliance building, and conflict resolution among diverse species with hugely different cultures and values and technological capabilities. Zoe's role in these diplomatic efforts displays the importance of understanding, empathy, and strategic thinking in resolving conflicts and attempting to build peace. The book also explores various facets of family and belonging, from Zoe's relationship with her adoptive parents, John and Jane, to her connection with her Oban protectors, Hickory and Dickory. It examines the bonds that form families, both biological and chosen, and how these relationships shape individuals and their understanding of home. When I first picked up Zoe's Tale, I was somewhat skeptical about its necessity given its parallel narrative to The Last Colony, but Scalzi, true to form, managed to craft a story that not only paced itself beautifully, but also supplements and complements The Last Colony in a meaningful way, addressing and essentially mitigating my most searing criticism of the previous book. While both The Last Colony and Zoe's Tale stand out as impressive works in their own right, I do think that combining them into a single unified narrative would have made for a more even-keeled experience, despite effectively doubling the page count of one book. Look, these books aren't exactly high art by any means. For the most part, they're the literary equivalent of a popcorn flick. They're fun, they're engaging, they're emotionally resonant, but they're not really challenging in terms of complexity or depth. Scalzi's prose isn't exactly innovative or exceptionally intellectual, but it's not trying to be, and it doesn't need to be, in order to tell a really good story. And that's what this series is so far, a really good story. Overall, Zoe's Tale offers a fresh perspective on the events of The Last Colony, bringing some nuance to the saga that might have been missed otherwise. With this book, Scalzi proves that even in a genre dominated by grand ideas of a cosmic scale, the personal journeys of well-crafted characters can be the most compelling stories of all. It's a vivid reminder of the power of perspective in storytelling, and it's a valuable addition to the Old Man's War series. Have you read The Last Colony or Zoe's Tale? If so, what are your thoughts? Let me know down below. If you liked this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. I upload a new video every week. Well, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it and I'll see you in the next one. Until then, read on.